is the cross of Jesus redemptive? It is a question I am surprised has even arisen in some of my recent studies. After all, we all believe we know the cross. We wear it around our necks. We paint it above our steeple doors. And yet this sign 2,000 years ago was not a sign of hope or redemption. As Tom Holland notes in his book Dominion, it was a sign of torture, of cruelty, the ugliest form of capital punishment which would strike fear and terror into the heart of any who would pass it by. As James H. Cohn notes in his article, Daring the Cross, Daring Down the Lynching Tree, about the life and ministry of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., and in his acclaimed book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, this was true of the forms of brutal execution carried out against African American communities in the heart of the 20th century, and is still true today with the deaths of figures such as Trayvon Martin, whom Cohn's described as a contemporary lynching, and in light of the recent death of George Floyd. And as a result of these forms of continual brutal acts of violence, it has been the opinion of contemporary black womanist theologians and of even radical Franciscan theologians such as Richard Rohr, and even some positive proponents of the Christus Victor model of the atonement, that we should instead attempt to draw a wedge between the life of Jesus and his call for social justice and the horrendous tragic death of Jesus of Nazareth, which we should extend merely as a horror and not as an act of redemptive love. This is not true of every contemporary theologian. And these new voices that have arisen, I am sure, are advocating this position from a place of personal hurt and systemic viewing of the misuse and abuse of the symbol of the cross by hate groups and other organizations. Nevertheless, I will endeavor in this recording to defend the cross of Christ as the window through which God has shown radical solidarity with our suffering, which he calls redemptive, and our call toward solidarity with one another. This is not merely a thesis for me. It is not merely an academic appraisal for me. As a visually impaired blind individual who has encountered and encounters even a recording this, some level of regular discomfort. As one who has also encountered deep personal suffering in light of my own Christian witness, I have found that in the cross of Jesus, God has met me in my own tears and has led me to deeper love, acceptance, and healing. Where is one to begin with the defense of the cross? I am by nature a traditionalist. I would love to quote Galatians, Colossians 1 and Philippians 2. I have been crucified with Christ, Paul states. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It is the sign of God's redemption and power to end the yoke of the powers of darkness. And yet I have been asked here to focus on contemporary theology. And so I turn now to James H. Cohn's description of the ministry of King, Martin Luther King, and how he lived out the very redemptive message of the cross that Paul and Jesus himself speaks about in God's holy and inerrant word. Reverend King did not simply grow up with the cross as a sign of jewelry. According to James H. Cohn, he grew up in a community that had undergone regular lynching, his father having witnessed the brutality firsthand as a little boy. King grew up with hymns and spirituals, 
singing, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? King grew up singing about the blood of Jesus, taking communion, knowing that the blood of this Emmanuel God with us would empower him to take God's personal solidarity with him and his African-American community's experience of suffering into the cry and call for justice, not only for his own people, but for all the impoverished and hurting people of the world. This was so true that it would take him to places of deep spiritual darkness. We read in James H. Cohn's article, Bearing the Cross, Staring Down the Lynching Tree, of how he was threatened with bombing against his home and the threat of execution. And this brought him to his knees and it led him to question whether he should return back. One of his parishioners saw that he was a little less stalwart one day and he heard her ask him, is it because we're not with you all the way or is it, and I'm quoting here, those white folks who are giving you too much trouble? But even if we don't go with you all the way, she said, God's gonna take care of you. And after hearing about that bomb threat, Reverend King got down on his knees. And in that moment of crisis in his Gethsemane, he says that the voice of Jesus came to him. And the voice of Jesus reminded him that he was going to take care of him. Reverend King's house was bombed. His wife and daughter were inside. Before he learned that his wife and daughter were all right, that they were preserved, that they were protected, because of King's belief that he had a participation in the cross of Jesus, and because he believed that Jesus had said from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. When an angry mob wanted to retaliate against a local white community, King said to them words to the effect that they were compelled by Jesus to love their neighbor, even in the wake of a tragedy like this. King would so live out this reality that he would willingly accept an assassin's bullet on April 4th, 1968. Later on, the famous Irish rock band U2 would memorialize this moment by summarizing, one man came in the name of love, one man he resist. One man came to a barbed wire fence, one man to overthrow. In the name of love, what more in the name of love? This poetic, figurative example of resistance that you too demonstrated in memorializing King as he stepped onto that balcony and accept whatever fate would come, was and remains a sign to us that the life of King was a living, gushing forth of his belief that the cross of Jesus meant not only the forgiveness of his sins personally, but a call to preach reconciliation and justice to all who would be willing to listen. It did not end with mere intellectual abstractions that he was saved and therefore he could go and put his feet up on the sofa. Instead, because he was saved, he was then called to be empowered by grace through faith, to recreate societies and systems of oppression into deeper conformity with the will of Christ. This is certainly true of what happened on May the 25th of 2020, when a police officer placed his knee on the neck of George Floyd, gasping, crying, I cannot breathe, leading to a social movement that spread around the entire world. The Black Lives Matter movement, irrespective of if you are a liberal or conservative, reshaped the way in which 
we think of law enforcement and justice in the Western world. It was a sign to the world that in this victimized individual, in this hurting individual, there was a call to recreate systems of oppression and to make them free and just, to bring them in conformity with a life lived out in reconciliation and in healing. It was a call for reformation and for protest, born by the cross, born by God's solidarity with us. King felt through his spiritual hymns and reflections that in every suffering individual, there was Jesus crucified. When people looked on the death of George Floyd, they saw an image of one man suffering needlessly, and they came in some spiritual sense to the foot of the cross. And they were empowered, many of them, to take to the streets because they believed in their hearts that further work needed to be done. Julian of Norwich and many medieval theologians describe personal reflection upon the wounds of Jesus. Seeing in our wounds, like her through an experience of deep convalescence when she was quite ill, a participation in the suffering of Jesus. This was true for me in 2016. Although I lost my eyesight as a five-year-old boy, I was misdiagnosed with a genetic disorder when it was really a brain tumor. In 2016, I learned that my loss of vision was due to that tumor and that swift surgery would be needed. While I was relatively pious, I did not personally know Jesus at that point. I encountered him intimately and personally as I encountered grave physical suffering and a protracted form of convalescence. And like Julian of Norwich, meditating on the crucifixion wasn't just helpful. It allowed me in my bitterness and pain to thank those who had come to my bedside, to my cross. It motivated me afterwards to try and be a voice of healing and of accompaniment to all suffering people to whom I had been sent. It was not the moment, but certainly a link in the chain that led me towards a call towards ministry. I found, and I still find in my regular discomforts, that in the cross of Jesus, I know that God knows what it is to bleed. God knows what it, what it is to cry. God knows what it is to feel even abandoned, crying from the cross, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? If that is the extent to which God has shown solidarity with me, that is the extent to which I must show solidarity with my neighbor. It doesn't end merely with my own personal forgiveness. It extends towards what I do in the world. I do not claim for a single moment that political movements that were spawned after the death of King respond after the death of Floyd were entirely biblical or just. I do not claim that political activism is the fruit of the cross. In fact, I worry deeply whether there is a kind of idolatrous obsession with political activism at times, and perhaps less of an emphasis on our forgiveness and reconciliation. And some of the tones of vengeance after the death of Floyd and after the death of King, and some of the tones of a cry for an eye for an eye, are certainly not in keeping with the cross and not in keeping with the message of Jesus' reconciliation. And yet, at the same time, what I see in the cross of Jesus is the reality that even in our pit of despair, we are never alone, because God has entered into that pit with us. And so we are then called to enter into the dark night of the soul of others, bearing the torch of God's mighty love. I hope that this has been 
instructive, and I would say so much more if I had the time, but I pray it has been a source of peace.